guess that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm supposed to be one of the organizers, so I should <laughs> start. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, this will be a series of lectures on uh, 2D conformal field theories, um, and uh, here's an outline of the the topics. Uh, I've posted a draft of the uh, lecture notes on the wiki page. Uh, the the notes was just updated this morning. Has a little bit more material than um, I can cover in four lectures. When I say a little more, I mean a little more, not ten times more. <laughs> um, uh, um, um, uh, so the, the outline is the following. So I will uh, today discuss uh, the defining properties, at least from the operator, local operator point of view, uh, of 2D CFTs. Um, and then I will hopefully discuss a little bit about virtual conformal blocks. Um, that will be. Uh, 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 then I'll finish that discussion in the next lecture, um, and we'll discuss that in the um, uh, and I'll illustrate uh, all of this in the uh, very explicit example of the 2D um, icing CFT, which is the simplest non-trivial uh, unitary conformal field theory. Um, and um, then I will discuss uh, uh, in the third lecture, which will be next week. Uh, uh, symmetries and uh, their generalizations, namely topological defects in uh, the context of 2D CFTs, again illustrated with the example of the 2D icing CFT. Um, uh, it will be also, this topic will also be connected to some of the other uh, uh, lectures at the school as it will be related to things like total anomaly and uh, orbitals and all that. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, I plan to discuss a little bit about um, Massive or relevant deformations of the icing CFT, which will lead to some interesting physics. And in fact, you know, you might think that every question you can ask about 2D icing CFT uh, has already a no answer, but that's not entirely the case, as we'll uh, hopefully come to. Um, and uh, uh, originally, that was my plan of lectures, but then I felt a little guilty of only talking about the icing CFT and nothing else. So um, I think that I only have time for this, but in the, in the lecture notes, there, there's more material. And uh, maybe I'll be able to, able to comment on other 2D CFTs um, at the very end, if we have the time. Um, so um, <coughs> um, we'll start by uh, talking about uh, the defining properties. So. Um, for most of these uh, lectures, I will uh, avoid using uh, the language of Lagrangian or path integral um, uh, because well, I, I'll prefer to talk about things like the Hamiltonian and local operators because those objects are um, unambiguously defined in the quantum theory. Um, so a, a 2D CFT, uh, so our uh, and throughout these lectures, we'll be working in the realm of um, uh, relativistic quantum field theories, relativistic local quantum field theories with a stress energy tensor. Um, so any uh, uh, quantum field theory uh, has a conserved stress energy tensor that's a symmetric uh, traceless tensor that obeys a conservation, conservation law. Um, uh, it's a well-defined local operator. Uh, suppose we have well-defined quirking functions and separated points and so, so on and so forth. Um, now. Uh, of course, whenever you see an operator with some indices, you, you want to organize that according to representations of the Lorentz group. Uh, so a symmetric traceless, uh, sorry, a symmetric rank 2 tensor representation of the Lorentz group is uh, not irreducible. It contains a trace part, which is a singlet, and the symmetric traceless representation. So it's natural to split the stress ten tensor into its trace part and the traceless part. Uh, normally, uh, you cannot just you don't want to just throw out the trace part because you throw out the trace part, it's no longer conserved. Um, so a, a CFT is uh, a quantum field theory that has a conserved stress energy tensor and that the trace part is zero. So that's the basic definition. Um, and uh, this uh, 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 property, of the, which is equivalent to conformal invariance, um, um, has uh, profound implications. Uh, uh, first of all, it implies a enhanced uh, set of um, uh, conserved charges. North occurrence you can uh, build by contracting T mu nu with appropriate uh, uh, vector fields known as conformal killing vectors. Um, and uh, some aspects of that was discovered, uh, was, was discussed in uh, Slava's lectures, lecture yesterday. Um, in 2D, there's a kind of a kind of bigger enhanced uh, a set of 
uh, north occurrence given the stressless condition. Um, that's easy to see if we uh, uh, work in, let's say, a Euclidean space, uh, write, uh, well, I'll write the line element in this way, dz, dz bar in Euclidean signature. So z is, say, uh, I use not convention sigma 1 plus i sigma 2, uh, where sigma 1 and sigma 2 are the usual Euclidean coordinates in uh, two-dimensional Euclidean space, and z is a complex coordinate. Um, and uh, then uh, this condition is a statement that the component t z z bar is equal to zero. Um, so the non-trivial component of the stress energy tensor, uh, of a traceless stress energy tensor in 2D Euclidean space, uh, are t z z and t z bar z bar. And the conservation law will say that par partial with back to a z bar of T Z Z equals zero, so it will say that T Z Z is a uh, operator that depends holomorphically on the coordinate Z, and T Z bar Z bar depends uh, anti-holomorphically on the coordinate. Um, the statement that these are holomorphic or anti-holomorphic operators, so these are supposed to be understood as operator equations. Um, they hold at the level of quirky functions up to contact terms. Um, okay, so. Uh, now, uh, uh, I think most of you should have seen uh, this before. Um, the, uh, uh, to proceed, we well, can I discuss the operator product expansion of the um, stress energy tensor. Uh, so um, if you're given, oh, actually, b before, before saying that, I should say that um, the uh, uh, one uh, sort of Essential consequence of the uh, conformal symmetry is that uh, there's a well, there's a conformal mapping between uh, the Euclidean signature between the uh, punctured plane uh, to the cylinder, which you can the Euclidean cylinder, which you can then uh, and then continue to Lorentzian signature. Um, so we'll be speaking of you know operators inserted on the plane versus operators inserted on, on the cylinder. We can talk about the coordinate functions on either side. Uh, now. Um, this mapping such that uh, uh, a local operator, um, let's call it O, at the origin of the punctured plane at the puncture, uh, will be identified with a state, uh, I don't know, by O cat on the cylinder, or uh, the state of the CFT on the circle. Um, so uh, I, mean, I will use interchangeably the language of the state on the circle and the cylinder, they mean the same thing. Um, uh, so this is known as the state operator mapping. Um, so uh, and, you know, on, on the cylinder, there's a you know, Hamiltonian the generated time evolution that correspond to um, evolution in the radial direction on the plane. Uh, so. Um, if you have uh, the insertion of uh, a pair of local operators on the plane, say maybe a stress energy tensor here, T at Z, and then, by the way, I should introduce the notation. This will be denoted by T of Z, and this will be denoted by T tilde of Z bar. So let's say if I have T of Z inserted at one point and T at zero inserted at the origin, um, and then I can look at uh, uh, the state created on the on some circle um, by these two uh, by inserting these two operators in the inside the disk. Um, so that state on that circle, um, which is state on cylinder by the state operator mapping, should be uh, re-expressible in terms of uh, some operator at the origin. So in other words, I should be able to express uh, the product of T z with T zero as an operator at origin by the state operator mapping. So uh, this implies that I should be able to express Tz multiplied by T0 um, uh, as a, I should be able to decompose that on the basis of um, uh, local operators uh, graded by uh, their uh, conformal scaling dimension, um, which I'll define more precisely um, in, in a moment. Um, and that is the notion of the operator product expansion. So the operator product expansion in the case of the stress energy tensor, we'll say that the product, Tz, T0, um, should be expressible uh, in terms 
of some linear, co linear combination of uh, operators of increasing dimension. Um, and um, uh, they generally take the following form. Uh, let me write down the expression, which uh, probably all of you have seen before, and explain it's where it comes from. Uh, so when I write this wiggly line, I mean I'm ignoring uh, terms of order 1, and order z, z squared, and so forth. Uh, so I'm only keeping terms that are singular in the z goes to 0 limit. Um, the reason that there should be an upper product expansion of this form between a pair of the stress energy tensors uh, follows from the word identity. So the stress energy tensor is the nota current that generates translation. Um, in the case of uh, uh, the conformal theory, where you have the Tz that is holomorphic, uh, you also, uh, if Tz is holomorphic, then uh, any holomorphic function, say epsilon of z, multiplying by Tz, um, is also holomorphic, and therefore it can serve current. The holomorphic, the z component of it can serve current. Um, so if you take epsilon to be uh, 1, it generates, this is another current that generates the translation in the holomorphic, the holomorphic component of the current. If you take epsilon to be z, then it generates um, dilatation. Um, so uh, um, uh, if you take those northern current and integrate along a contour that surrounds the operator, that's, that produces the corresponding northern charge. Uh, so if you take the northern charge and act on the operator, you're supposed to produce a symmetry transformation of that operator. So uh, for instance, uh, if you take uh, the contour integral of this thing, of z going around the origin, you pick up this term over here, uh, and that just amounts to taking the uh, northern current associated, the northern charge associated associate with translation, I count t, and therefore you generate the translation, which is derivative of t. Uh, on the other hand, if you take, if you take z times t, this guy here, which will be the northern current associated with dilatation, uh, if you do this contour integral, uh, you'll pick up this term here, which will generate um, rescaling, and this too has to do with the, the fact that the stress and tensor in 2D has uh, scaling dimension 2. So uh, as you can see, these two terms are fixed by the word identities associated with the uh, water charge. And um, uh, this term uh, is uh, there because, uh, because you can write it down. You can have some constant times identity operator uh, just by matching the dimension. This has dimension 2. This has dimension 2. So this would have mass dimension 4. Both are 1 to z to the fourth. Um, and if you assume that, that there, are, there are no operators of negative dimension, or 0 or negative and no operator of zero dimension other than identity, um, then in fact, uh, these things are uh, the only things, the right-hand side are the only things th that you can write down that are compatible with um, the associativity and the commutativity of the OPE. Okay, so these are essentially the, the only um, uh, form of the operator product expansion of the stress energy, tens stress energy tensor that will be uh, allowed in the 2D conformal field theory. And this constant C here is known as the central charge that will be of uh, significance. Uh, okay. Any questions so far? Um, so a uh, now I said that the the stress and tensor is conserved, and in this case, meaning that it's the component T Z is holomorphic um, in the absence or away from other uh, insertion of local operators in the coordinate function. So, for example, if I consider some Coordination function in the form Tz, O as Z1, Z1 bar, da da da, there's some other operator. Then this coordinate function as a function of Z will be holomorphic as long as Z is away from Z1. Uh, but when the Z coincides with Z1, there can be some singularities. In fact, you have already seen an example over here. So um, uh, if you always stress any tensor is itself, there's going to be a pole and, as Z approaches Z1. <coughs> um, so uh, now let's assume that you have some operator at the origin on the complex plane. Um, and uh, the stress energy tensor Tz, uh, in the presence of this uh, operator or state, uh, I'll use these terms interchangeably with understanding of the state, state operator map. Operator map um, this Tz will be holomorphic uh, away from 0. Uh, it will be a meromorphic function with uh, uh, with possibly singularity at, at the origin. Um, in this case, we can always do the Laurent expansion. So we'll not be able to do the Taylor expansion in general in this case, but we can do a Laurent expansion. So we can write Tz as 
uh, the sum n from minus infinity to infinity, uh, ln over z to the n plus 2, uh, this is a convention. The 2 comes from the, uh, has to do with the weight of Tz itself. Um, uh, conversely, you can write ln as the contour integral uh, of z to the n plus 1 times Tz, or something integer n. So uh, uh, these are some, can be viewed as some charges associated with um, the stress under the tensor of a conformal field theory. Um, and of course, there's also going to be a anti-holomorphic analog. This is related to Ln uh, bar in my convention. Okay. Um, it's a, a standard uh, textbook exercise uh, which I will not uh, reproduce in detail here, uh, that uh, given this OPE, um, in fact, let me write it here, uh, given this OPE of the pair of stress and the tensor, so so far we only determined uh, the singular terms in the OPE. There's, uh, the, the full upper product expansion has infinite many terms of higher and higher powers of z, uh, but just a singular part of OPE is enough uh, to determine um, the uh, algebra of these uh, Ln generators with that commutation relation. Um, so you can determine the algebra of Ln with Lm uh, or something. Uh, what do I mean by that? So first of all, I uh, should explain the logic of this. Um, so Ln so far defined as a contour integral of um, the stress energy tensor. Uh, it's understood that this Ln can be viewed as in the presence of some operator O at the origin, if I now perform, if I insert a stress and tensor Tz and perform this contour integral along a contour that encircles the origin in a counterclockwise direction, uh, then um, uh, that acts on O to produces a new state. Uh, in fact, uh, because this uh, Tz is, so in, in the absence of other operators in the vicinity of this you know, this, this, this operator O and the contour, um, uh, we know that Tz depends holomorphically on Z. So you can shrink this contour to arbitrarily small size uh, without changing the resulting state. Um, and so you can sh shrink this down to infinitesimal size, and you end up with another local operator. So if you take this Ln and act on the local operator at the origin, you produce another local operator. So what do you know that's by Ln acting on the result of Ln acting on the operator? So in that sense, Ln is a, uh, well, here I represent it as a contour integral of T. It's a charge, uh, or some kind of charge, um, associated with this motor current. And it's a charge that it can be viewed as a, now an operator acting on some Hilbert space. This Hilbert space is spanned by local operators at the origin. Um, and because now Ln is viewed as an operator that acts on local operators at the origin, it me it's meaningful to speak of their commutation relations. Uh, and this commutation relation, uh, can be uh, deduced in the following way. So, uh, so, well, I'll just, I'll just, yeah. When you integrated uh, t of z around there, did you also have some power of z to pick out ln? Uh, well, uh, the power of z is over here, right? That's in the definition of ln. Yeah, I was just looking at the, the picture that you had t of z. Oh, uh, I mean, I didn't really write what. <laughs> I, I'll just write this <laughs> ln. Okay. So, so, I, I don't mean just to integrate t of z. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So. Uh, now, um, if you act with, uh, well, I, I said that you know, exactly how big you choose this contour doesn't matter. That's in the absence of other operators. Now, if you have a pair of these things, then the, um, the relative ordering of the contour does matter. Uh, so for example, if, you have, uh, if I act with Lm first, for some m, and I act with Ln, um, then um, you can deform these two contours independently, as long as they don't pass the origin, where you have some operator O inserted, uh, you can also not pass this contour generally to each other uh, because uh, there's a T here and there's a T here. If they collide, there can be a singularity. And if you want to maintain um, this, the result of this contour integral, uh, a priori, you, you do not want to move the contours past each other. Uh, that's why, depending on the ordering, which contour is outside, which contour is inside, you can get different answers. Uh, so the commutator can be calculated by comparing this uh, to uh, uh, and Lm, so you have a different order of these two contours. Um, and you can put these two pictures together. For example, you can 
identify this contour with this contour here. They're both for Ln. Uh, uh, actually, let me do it the other way around. Let me identify this contour Lm with this contour Lm. So this is the same as uh, uh, integrating Ln over here, but Lm along uh, the sum of uh, of these uh, two con contours. One is counterclockwise outside, and the other one uh, clockwise inside. Uh, this picture is a little bit confusing. I should uh, use a better notation. Maybe I should say. This contour is C1 and C2. Uh, so, so here, uh, what this picture means, actually, use some colored chalk. Uh, what, what this picture means is that um, I keep the same contour integral uh, for the, that defines the Ln. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, I meant, uh, yes, I meant Ln. Wait, sorry. I, I actually meant to write LM. It's a little confusing. Sorry. LM. Um, so I take this contour uh, to be the same as this contour here, which is the same as this contour integral over here. Um, and the difference between this LN contour outside and LN contour inside is now represented by the appropriate contour integral, the same contour integral, over the sum of the contour C1 and C2 in here. Uh, then for any given uh, point on this Lm contour, um, the Ln contour, which involves some integral of some holomorphic function multiplying Tz along the sum of C1 and C2, uh, can be kind of, you can kind of shrink the, the sum of these two contours, which enclose only this point and not all 0 You can shrink that contour down to um, uh, To a contour that only surrounds uh, uh, this this point where the stress and tensor associated with the Lm contour integral is is involved, and, and that thing you can calculate uh, simply using the singular part of the TTOPE because uh, you know uh, everything else will drop out of that contour integral, uh, and that's why you can determine this uh, Ln Lm commutation relation just from the the TTOPE. Anyway, this is a standard calculation. The, the result is a uh, is m minus m l m plus m uh, plus c over 12 n cubed minus n delta n minus m uh, is known as the centrally extended Verisora algebra um, of center charge c. Uh, this is the uh, the fundamental uh, uh, Algebra rela algebraic relation of these um, conserved charges, Ln, uh, in a 2D CFT. Uh, and because they act on the space of local operators, um, uh, you can then organize uh, the space, the set of local operators, according to representations of the Verisora algebra. Um, OK. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Can you say why? Ln are referred to as conserved charges when they don't commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, well, is it conserved only in the sense that if you deform the contour, uh, the result repeat, does not. Repeat the question. Uh, sorry, the, the question is why are uh, do I call Ln conserved charges? Uh, well, they are conserved only in the sense uh, that uh, if I deform this contour in the presence of, uh, in the absence of local operator in the vicinity of the contour, the result is invariant. So, so they are they're invariant. Uh, but, but, but nothing more than that. Um, and here you can you can simply view this object here as some holomorphic current that's built out of the stress and tensor. So no, this is right just a. The fact that it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, that's okay. Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, well, it, it's it's well, it, it's conserved in precisely the sense that I described. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's conserved in the same sense that any other charge will be conserved because the current is cons is conserved. Um, um, okay. Um, so uh, <coughs> I should, uh, before uh, talking about uh, local operators, other local operators in some detail, um, I should uh, explain uh, the word identities and how the charges uh, act on local operator. Um, uh, so, uh, so here I just described, I just said that you can, you, you can act uh, 
all of the LNs on local operator, but um, there's a way to kind of connect that to uh, what it means to perform a conformal transformation on the operator. So, so far I haven't, uh, you know, I said that this stress and tensor is supposed to generate some enhanced symmetry, which is a conformal symmetry. I, I, well, Slava ex explained uh, what that means in higher than two dimensions. I haven't said what conformal symmetry, um, I didn't say what conformal symmetry means geometrically. Um, uh, logically, I don't need to explain what it, what it is log geometrically because I've already explained everything that you need to know about conformal symmetry. But it, it, help, it helps kind of getting a, um, to understand this, this picture uh, by having a geometric understanding of the symmetry. Uh, so let me explain that briefly here. Um, so uh, as I said, if you have some holomorphic function epsilon of z uh, locally, uh, so if you only care about uh, the local property of the current, it, suffi it suffices to have some local, uh, some holomorphic function that's uh, holomorphic on some domain. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, if you have epsilon of z, which is holomorphic, you multiply by t of z, that is still holomorphic, uh, uh, obviously. And you can take that to be uh, a new conserved current. Uh, so in, in general, I can write some conserved current j z, j tilde z bar. Uh, which is defined to be, I put a minus sign here by convention, uh, minus some epsilon uh, tilde of z bar, t tilde z bar. Okay, so this thing, uh, th this current is, uh, is conserved in the sense I described, um, and it generates, uh, so uh, uh, you, can, you can write down the associated um, uh, northern charge, which is the contour integral of this current around some, acting on some operator. Uh, so let's say you have some operator uh, O, at a point, uh, let's say z, z bar, um, generally not holomorphic, um, then uh, with back to this symmetry, the symmetry variation, which is called uh, delta epsilon of O, um, is by definition uh, given by, so the infinitesimal symmetry transformation of O generated by this, this, this current, by definition, is given by the nota charge acting on the operator. And nota charge is the contour integral. So the contour integral, some contour enclosing z, uh, dw over 2 pi i, epsilon of w, t of w, and o, z, z bar, uh, plus the anti-holomorphic part. Uh, uh, no, it's minus and minus i here. So it becomes, minus. Uh, yeah, uh, anyway, it's an appropriate conjugate term. Um, uh, so, um, okay. Uh, so uh, this is supposed to be. So well, the, the, this this not a current that is um, uh, expressed in terms of epsilon z and epsilon tilde z bar is supposed to generate uh, what we would call an infinitesimal conformal transformation. This is definition. Okay, uh, so when, then we'll say that the um, infinitesimal conformal transformation of the stress and tensor itself, say at z, uh, well, you can just plug into this formula now, just replace O by t, uh, and um, then because we assume the epsilon is holomorphic in the domain of interest, not necessarily holomorphic everywhere, but holomorphic in the domain of interest, which is the domain enclosed by this contour, uh, then um, this contour integral will again only pick up uh, singular terms from this TTOPE. So this is, the, so this conformal transformation of the stress and the tensor is once again determined by just the singular terms in the OPE, TTOPE minus C over 12 partial cubed epsilon of Z minus 2 partial epsilon of Z T of Z minus epsilon of Z partial T of Z. Okay. <coughs> Now, um, of course, um, when, when uh, epsilon is, uh, if epsilon z is a constant, then this is just translation. In the case of translation, we want to, sometimes it's useful to have an intuitive picture that where, in which we associate translation with actual trans translation of the coordinate. So far, for, for me, translation symmetry is just the name that's generated by this current, but you can think of it as related to a transformation of the coordinate. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, 
what, now, when I write a conformal transformation as a, as a change of the coordinate z, this is purely uh, a geometric picture to guide your intuition. Okay, whenever I speak of conformal transformation, you should always think of the action of that northern charge in the quantum theory. So, uh, but nonetheless, it helps to guide our thinking uh, by uh, viewing the conformal transformation as a, as a change of coordinate z uh, to z plus epsilon z. And then it turns out that um, the, uh, uh, this way of representing the conformal transformation is compatible uh, with the composition of uh, successive infinitesimal transformation is defined like that. So you can, you can check that uh, they compose correctly. Uh, so if you have z to epsilon 1 of z and then do this transformation again with epsilon 2, uh, you have the composed transformation and that will, that will agree with the transformation generated by those notar charges. Um, and uh, if so, uh, you can then go to composed uh, infinite, infinite many infinitesimal trans conformal transformation together and obtain a finite conformal transformation. And evidently, the general finite form of this transformation would just be z going to some, uh, say, z prime, which is some holomorphic function of z. Uh, let me emphasize that I only need this transformation to, be, uh, to make sense locally on some domain if I'm talking about the conformal transformation of local operators within some domain. So I, don't, I do not need these epsilon z or f of z to be globally defined for the sake of the discussion so far. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a nice formula for the finite version of this uh, 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 conformal transformation of T of Z if you compose uh, infinitely many of these infinitesimal transformations together. Uh, I will, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it, it, you can guess such a formula, it's easy to, it's easy to verify that your guess is correct. Um, so the, the general transformation of of t is such that um, the t goes to some t prime. Let me, let me just emphasize again, because this is <coughs> often a confusing uh, point, uh, the, this uh, transformation in the box is strictly to guide your thinking. Has, uh, you know, uh, whenever I speak of the transformation of the operator, I mean the action of successive, successive transformation by acting with those charges. So t goes to t prime. Uh, uh, under some finite conformal transformation, um, you can deduce what is T prime uh, by uh, looking at this, by studying the infinitesimal version of it. Uh, An answer is that uh, uh, T prime, uh, not as Z, but as Z prime, which is given by this F of Z, uh, is equal to, um, well, if you multiply this by partial Z prime with back to Z uh, squared, is T of Z minus C over 12, uh, z prime bracket with z. This is the Schwarzschild derivative. Uh, I guess these days, everyone who has seen a talk on SYK has seen Schwarzschild derivative, so I won't have to uh, write that. You can find this in standard textbooks also. Um, um, I just want to uh, emphasize here that uh, when I say a conformal transformation, it's always supposed to be understood as active symmetry acting on local operators, Tz, to T prime at Z. This formula expresses T prime as Z prime in terms of T as Z. So if you want to actually see what T prime of Z itself is, you have to translate thing, this from Z prime back to Z. Okay, that, that. Um, and, and you can, it's, a, uh, it's an exercise to, to, to verify that the infinitesimal version of this reduces that. Yes? Uh, you, 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 could, you could certainly say that, but I, I want to avoid, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, Slavo is complaining that I, I want to emphasize this is only to guide your thinking because he wants to think of this as something more physical. Uh, you are, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Uh, 
Um, okay, so um, um, a basic consequence of this finite form of the transformation is that it can be applied to this uh, example of the component transformation relating the punctured plane uh, to the cylinder. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, z is a coordinate on the plane, uh, the puncture at the origin, and uh, w, uh, which I could write as um, uh, sigma plus i tau, is a coordinate on the Euclidean cylinder, uh, where this sigma is identified with sigma plus 2 pi. Uh, then I can map one to the other by writing z to be e to the minus i w. Um, and then, uh, so here the stretch and tensor in this, in this z frame, uh, which, called, which I now indicate by tzz uh, to avoid confusion, because here they, I have a tww, which is the um, stress and the tensor in a different conformal frame. Uh, they're related by the transformation I wrote over there. Uh, so if you plug in the formula, you'll find that tww uh, at w is equal to tzz at z multiplied by some factor partial w z squared uh, plus c over 24. So in this case, in this example of the exponential map, the Schwarzian derivative just collapses to a constant. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, now, uh, if you before uh, we wrote this Laurent series uh, of tz in terms of, L, of ln, um, so those are uh, the, those lns are defined um, by this kind of contour integrals along these kind of contours. Uh, now, uh, if you map this to a cylinder, you're just doing the contour integral along a spatial circle. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, if you plug in, the same uh, uh, charges Ln would now appear in uh, the Fourier expansion of TWW on the cylinder. So, so just plug that thing in, into here. So TWW of W is, in fact, minus sum over N from minus infinity to infinity Ln e to the INW plus this shift c over 24, and uh, uh, like, likewise tw w bar, w bar is uh, minus the same thing with ln barred e to the minus i n w bar plus, uh, I guess I didn't write the, that uh, there can be a different central charge for t tilde, so I'll write this as c tilde for the central charge of the anti-holomorphic Viasor algebra which is independent from the, from the holomorphic Viasor algebra. I guess I forgot to say that the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, charges will commute. Uh, this is because um, there's no non-singular OPE between T and T tilde. OK, uh, any questions so far? The reason I, I bother to uh, write down this uh, is the following. So uh, if you want to talk about um, uh, you know, time evolution, uh, and you know, uh, unitary time evolution in the unitary CFT, uh, we need to uh, analytically continue uh, our equivalent functions from uh, the Euclidean cylinder to the Lorentzian cylinder uh, by taking tau to be not real but purely imaginary. Uh, so if you do that, uh, w, uh, there's also w bar, of course, which is sigma minus i tau. If you do that and the continuation, w becomes sigma plus t and w bar becomes sigma minus t. So if you continue to Lorentzian signature, w and w bar are both real and no longer related by complex conjugation. Um, and you can see then that uh, in Lorentzian signature, t, w, w, uh, is, um, is, a, a, you know, is a Hermitian operator by itself, and so is t, w bar, w bar. Um, and uh, so if you ask, what is the um, uh, Hermitian conjugate of Ln dagger, well, that has nothing to do with L bar. That's equal to L minus N, as you can see from this formula here. If you demand that TWW, um, which can be written as T plus plus in Lorentzian signature to be Hermitian, then Ln dagger has to be L minus N. Likewise, uh, L bar N dagger is equal to L bar minus N. Okay, so uh, when we speak of a unitary CFT, what we mean is that there's a Hilbert space of the CFT on the circle, and there's a unitary time evolution, um, and the uh, energy and momentum which will be defined in terms of these this L, this LNs and LN bars um, 
uh, are uh, a part of the generators that, that obey these uh, kind of Hermitian conjugation relations. Um, and so because Ln dagger is L minus N, uh, we can speak of unitary representation of just the holomorphic versorial algebra or just the anti-holomorphic versorial algebra. They are completely independent. Any questions about that? OK, so uh, now let's talk about representations of the Virasora algebra. OK, so um, we're going to restrict ourselves to, um, oh, b before getting to that, actually, let me just uh, say that on the cylinder, uh, on the cylinder, uh, the Hamiltonian is, uh, uh, which you can get by integrating the appropriate component of the stress and tensor, namely T0, 0. You can rewrite it in terms of T plus plus, T minus minus. Anyway, you'll find that the Hamiltonian is L0 minus C over 24 plus L0 tilde minus C tilde over 24, and the momentum on a circle, this translation charge on, on a circle, um, is the difference between these two. OK. Um, so uh, now, um, so L0 and, and L0 tilde plays a special role. They relate to energy and momentum. Um, and uh, now we're going to analyze uh, representations of just the holomorphic Virasor algebra. Um, and because L0 is energy, we're going to focus on representations in which uh, the energy is bounded from below. Um, and uh, uh, in an irreducible representation in which L0 is bounded be below, from below, there's going to be a state of the lowest L0 eigenvalue. Uh, so uh, um, there's going to be some state, let's call it H, uh, in a Let's say, you know, right? E rep of Virasoro algebra uh, is generated by uh, some state H with the lowest L0 um, eigenvalue. Uh, let's say I use a notation that eigenvalue is H itself. Um, and so uh, the commutation relation of Virasoro algebra here. Uh, between L0 and L, Ln is such that if you act on it with Ln, uh, it's going to decrease the L0 eigenvalue by n. So if n is positive, uh, this better be 0. So n, we're then equal to 1. OK, so it's the, the lowest weight state would must obey this property. Um, so this is uh, a state that obeys this property is called a primary. This is called a primary primary state or primary operator by the state operator mapping. So such a state is related to some operator phi, uh, let's say so in origin, which, is, uh, which we'll refer to as a primary operator. Um, <clears throat> OK. Uh, now, uh, if you then, uh, um, if you then plug uh, these relations into uh, this kind of uh, word identity, uh, you'll be able to figure out how the primary operator transform under general conformal transformation. Um, because, well, you can do that simply by uh, rewriting this T in terms of the LNs, well, there'll be L positive N, L negative N, and L zero. Uh, if, if this operator O is a primary, then you already know how the Ln acts if n is not negative. Um, if n is negative, um, you find out that for holomorphic epsilon, uh, this, this right-hand side will drop out. And um, uh, so, in fact, the uh, conformal transformation of a primary can be completely determined in that way. Um, and uh, you'll find that uh, under conformal transformation, under conformal transformation, uh, a primary uh, phi h transform into phi h prime, and this tra transformation rule is phi h prime at z prime is equal to partial z z prime to the power of minus h phi 
h at z. This is a transformation rule that Slava wrote down yesterday. Um, here, I'm only keeping track of the holomorphic dependence, um, but a general operator in the CFT will, will not necessarily be holomorphic. You'll have both holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components. In that case, you also have to consider anti-holomorphic part of the conformal transformation as well. Um, but for now, let's just I inspect the holomorphic conformal transformations here. Um, so uh, now, uh, any questions about this? Uh, given the primary states, we can then generate this entire uh, space of, uh, associated with some irreducible representation of the Virasoro algebra by acting on this lowest weight state with raising operators. The raising operators are Ln for negative n. So uh, let me still keep this coming relation. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, sorry, the question is why are the all representations of the various algebra highest wave representations, or in this case, in my convention, lowest wave representations? Um, I didn't claim that. Uh, I'm just claiming that I'm restricting myself to such representations because these are the ones that are going to be interest for at least unitary conformal field theories, and also a large class of non unitary conformal field theories because I want the energy to be bounded from below. That's all. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so, um, as, I, as I just said earlier, the generic state in this representation will be of the form you take the state h. By the way, this is a kind of abusive notation. I'm, here I'm using h to indicate the weight of the state. In the actual CFT, there can be many operators of the same weight, or maybe there's no operator of any, some given weight, and, and so forth. So here I'm just using this, this to label some particular state. Um, so I can act on uh, this with some a sequence of uh, raising operators, which are L, say, minus N1, L minus N2, da, 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 L minus NK. Uh, I can use these commutation relations to always arrange uh, uh, these, uh, to, I can write the basis of these states such that um, this N1 through NK are in, uh, let's say, uh, descending order. So I can, I can take N1 to be greater than or equal to N2, greater than or equal to da da da, greater than or equal to nk. I, I'm free to do that because if it's not in this order, I can use the combination relation to rewrite as um, in a combination of states that's, that looks like this. Um, so uh, for convenience, I'm going to uh, use a shorthand notation. I'm going to write this whole thing as uh, curly L uh, minus capital N, where capital N uh, simply denotes a, um, a partition of integer uh, in descending order, this n1 through NK. Uh, so then I can write uh, so the uh, a uh, this curly L minus N of H uh, this form a complete basis um, of uh, the representation. Okay. Now th these states are not obviously independent. Um, uh, we'll see that in a unit unitary theory, depending on the standard charge, sometimes there can be relations among these states. Um, OK, so uh, in fact, uh, we'll, we'll do that now. So um, uh, uh, if you're working with a unitary theory, uh, there's a uh, positive um, definite inner product on uh, the Hilbert space of states or local operators. And so these lo operators must organize themselves into unitary representations of the Virasoro algebra. Um, uh, that means, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I consider um, uh, the inner product of the basis element, let's say L, uh, curly L minus capital M on H. Again, this represents a virus or chain here now. Uh, and uh, it's conjugate H uh, L minus N dagger. Uh, uh, let me define this to be uh, G N M. Um, uh, this is known as a gram matrix. Um, so uh, it's easy to check from the algebra and the 
the, the, the fact that L n dagger is L minus n, um, that, uh, and the fact that H is a primary, that um, these matrix elements will be non-zero only if n and m have the same level. The level is the, the sum of these um, uh, integers. So let's say uh, the, so I'm going to define the level to be, I write n absolute value to be the sum of n1, little n1 through plus all the way through nk. Um, so uh, this is non-zero if only, uh, only if n and m have the same level, say little n. Um, so I'll denote this by the level little n uh, grand matrix. Um, and of course, we can choose a normalization convention of, let's say, H is, uh, has union norm. And then the, these things are uh, completely determined by using computation relations, because uh, this stuff involves L positive n, and this involves L minus negative n. So you can just commute these through using the algebra, and eventually everything is determined by the algebra, uh, together with the weight H itself. OK. Uh, now, it's a nice exercise to work out what this grand matrix is at level 1, level 2, level 3, and so forth. Um, OK, so uh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, what time is it? OK, so um, I want to uh, discuss the uh, notion of uh, null states, because uh, they'll be particularly relevant for the example of the icing CFT that I'll elaborate on uh, uh, a bit later. Um, so um, uh, let's see. Uh, so the question is, um, we should demand that this matrix to, is uh, you know, positive uh, semi-definite. Uh, it could have uh, zero eigenvalues if um, uh, uh, some combination of these states happen to be zero. Um, now, uh, as I said, you know, in principle, all, comp all entries of this matrix can be uh, determined by the algebra. So you can just plug in and check and see uh, you know, whether uh, this matrix has maybe negative. If, if you find, if you discover, if you, if you calculate this, all the entries of the matrix, which are functions of standard charge C and H, and if you discover that um, it has some negative eigenvalue, then you arrive at a contradiction, which means that those values of C and H would be incompatible with the unitary representation of the Virasor algebra. So those values of H or and C cannot show up in the unitary CFT. Um, and if you find that this thing has a zero eigenvalue in it, then for the unitary CFT, it means that there must be some combination of these states that is actually zero itself. There will be some uh, uh, relations like that. Uh, now. Uh, well, this measure is actually pretty complicated if you kind of work it out. Work, work it out, but uh, but um, thanks to uh, Victor Katz, we there's a nice formula for the determinant. Uh, so I'll write down the formula. I will not explain the derivation of this formula. This it will do some uh, positive number uh, times uh, um, product. Uh, let's say uh, there's a pair of integers r and s, which are positive integers, such that their product r times s is between 1 and little n. Little n is the level here, the grand matrix. Uh, h minus h r comma s to some power, p n minus r s. Now let me explain this uh, notation here. So this h is the weight itself. I'm just factorizing this polynomial into, um, uh, uh, into powers of h minus some constant, h r s. Uh, I'll tell you what the h r s in, is in a moment. Uh, so this coefficient is some positive number. I don't care what it is. It doesn't, it's independent of h. Um, this uh, power here, uh, p, uh, this is the uh, integer partition number, or partition number. Uh, uh, just for completeness, let me say that uh, it can be written as sum of m uh, greater than or equal to 0, p of m cubed to the power m is equal to the product of m, sorry, of, let's say k, where then equal to 1, uh, 1 over 1 minus q to the k. So it's an it's a, it's a integer partition number. It's a different ways of partition this into positive integers. Um, and, uh, but more importantly, this hrs, uh, these uh, special, which are some kind of special values of, of weights, um, I'll write them in the following way. So hrs 
is equal to, well, this depends on the pair of integers r and s, uh, I write in the following form, uh, is equal to q squared over 4 uh, minus a quarter uh, r times b plus s over b squared. Uh, so what are q and b? So q is uh, b plus 1 over b, and uh, uh, q is re related to a central charge by c equals 1 plus 6 q squared. So there's some formula. So the details may not be uh, may not seem very illuminating at the, at the moment, um, uh, but but that's that's what it is. Uh, I will not get to it probably, but there's a section uh, later on in the lecture notes about Liouville theory where this formula have a is find, will find its uh, natural home. Um, uh, uh, it's a quadratic formula for B. That's correct. Uh, so you can exchange B with 1 over B, of course, but it corresponds to exchanging R with S. So, so it's, it's okay. Um, all right. Um, okay, so uh, uh, what this means is that, uh, you know, if you have, uh, if your weight H is one of these values, H R comma S, then there must be some null state. That is, there must be, uh, if you're in a unitary CFT, then there must be some relation among these um, uh, linear relation among these um, a priori distinct um, versorial descendants of that primary of the wedge h r comma s. Um, uh, in fact, it's, uh, the full story is much more uh, delicate. I won't have the time to uh, go into all the detail. Uh, it, it turns out that um, uh, if you analyze uh, uh, the consequence of the, the, this, the, the, this formula uh, uh, simultaneously for all levels, um, uh, you'll find that uh, the uh, possible um, unitary representations are, can be quite restrictive depending on uh, the value of the central charge. Uh, so um, I will not uh, derive this in full, but you know, they can be understood essentially as a consequence of this cast determinant formula. Um, <coughs> I'll just list some properties of unitary representations here. So unitary uh, representations uh, of Virasoro algebra. Uh, so this depends on the value of C and the weight H of the primary state. Um, so a, a few basic uh, uh, constraints are, are the following. So uh, first of all, H has to be non-negative. This is actually very easy to see. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this to you as an exercise. This follow from the level, demanding the level one grand matrix uh, to be positive. Um, and uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, and the only state with h equals zero must be annihilated by l minus one. I guess I didn't say that. Uh, you follow from this word identity that l minus one acting on operator O uh, is the same as the derivative of the operator. So this follows from the word identity that I wrote before, I have now erased. Um, so if h equals to 0, uh, then in the unitary theory, uh, this derivative of the operator uh, would have to be equal to 0, because this is equal to L minus 1, I think this would have to be equal to 0. Um, then in that case, the operator has to be proportional to identity. Uh, so all the non-identity operators in the unitary theory will have to have positive conformal weight. Uh, H and H bar. Uh, I'm just talking about the, the, the holomorphic weight here. Um, OK. Uh, now, uh, um, uh, depending on the value of C, uh, the center charge, you, can, you might have further restrictions. Um, so if the center charge is bigger than 1, um, then uh, uh, these, this is the only restriction. Um, if the center charge is equal to 1 or less than 1, uh, there are further restrictions. Um, okay, so uh, um, let me just say that when the center charge is equal to one, there exists uh, 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 prime you know, representations with uh, null states. I won't discuss this in detail. Uh, it's not too hard to work it out. Um, uh, uh, for C less than one. 
and sum charge has to be greater than, greater than or equal to zero. It turns out that if sum charge is equal to zero, uh, there are no non-trivial unitary representations. So the only representation is just the vacuum state by itself. Um, uh, so if C is greater than zero, between zero and one, um, then uh, uh, it turns out that um, the unitary representations only exist for discrete values, discrete set of values of the charge C. Uh, those values are C equals one minus six over M, M plus one, where M equals two, three, four, etc. So, So these values are, okay, uh, we erase two because two will correspond to C equals zero. So this will be uh, the C equal correspond to the correspond to C equals um, um, uh, one half and seven tenth and so forth. Uh, so there's a, a discrete set of values where representations are uh, unitary representations are possible, um, and unitary representation in this case uh, must always be one of these uh, HRSs. So H has to be HRS. Um, uh, I won't rewrite. This. You, can, you can plug in the formula. So, so this is HRS expressed in terms of the C, uh, with uh, some restri restriction on R between you know R is between one and minus one, and S is between one and M. Okay, I'm just writing down this formula just to just to show you what the constraints look like. Um, okay, uh, any questions about this? I, I'm not deriving these statements here. That, that's right. That means that there are always no states. Uh, sorry. The, the, yeah, the question, Slava's question is, uh, how is this compatible with the CATS formula? Because it seems I want this, this thing to be positive. The answer is that um, I don't need uh, this to be uh, positive at all levels. It needs to be positive up to some levels. And then above that, you will have no states. Then all of the de determinants will be 0. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's what happens. And, and, the, and it turns out that one can show that for C less than 1, um, uh, uh, Every unitary representation must have some null state. You actually cannot have a unitary representation with no null state at all, which is in contrast with the case of C greater than 1, where you can have, in fact, you know, all the unitary representations in C greater than 1 case uh, generally um, do not have any null states. OK. So uh, if you do have these null states, it actually uh, can ha greatly help uh, simplify or solving the theory because you get some non-trivial relations that you would not otherwise have expected. Uh, when you have no null states, the, uh, th those uh, relations would not be available. OK. Uh, let's see. OK, so um, I'm still in this defining properties part. Uh, uh, now let's discuss a little bit of the uh, OPE, um, not just of strength and tensor now, but of the general operators. Um, okay, so um, as I said before, I have two operators at two different points. Uh, from the point of radial quantization, you can think of the product as a new operator. So this is now uh, the sum of a bunch of operators that. Uh, that is uh, sitting at, at, at one given point, uh, I, write this, I write a sum because, well, it's just one operator, but I'd like to decompose that into a sum over operators of definite scaling dimension. Now, say O1 and O2 each have definite scaling dimension. The product operator does not have definite scaling dimension because the distance changes under dilatation. Um, so that, this product can be expressed as some operator at the origin, let's say. Uh, but that operator can now be further decomposed into on the basis of operators of increasing scaling dimension or conformal weights. Um, and uh, so uh, if you have, uh, well, this uh, logic uh, applies uh, in the sense that, so this is supposed to be an equality uh, with some appropriate uh, complicated coefficients here, of course, say a, k. This, this is meant to, uh, be a schematic uh, formula where some AK depends on the separation and, and all that. Um, this is supposed to be viewed as a uh, equality uh, in the following sense. So if you insert this, if you cut out this disk, cut out this disk, and insert this into any coordinate function, could be a safety on some general 
surface. Um, uh, there can be other operators inserted outside the disk, but as long as there are no other operators inside, inside this disk, um, then this uh, relation will hold at a level of coercion functions, more generally. OK. So uh, you can uh, then try to make uh, this kind of um, argument uh, uh, in the situation of a coordinate function of several operators. Let's say you have three operators, um, maybe like some coordinate function on, on the plane with other possible, many more operators, 100 other operators inserted elsewhere. Um, so, so then you can consider uh, the radial evolution with back to some point, arbitrary point, say over here, uh, and inspect the states on this circle that encircles these two operators, but not the third one. Uh, so you can replace these two by some operator, and then study its OPE with the third operator. Uh, or you can uh, take the same picture, uh, but draw a circle around these two operators, uh, and consider the state that lives on this circle produced by these two operators, uh, and then take its OPE with the third one. And these two are supposed to be completely equivalent because I'm just you know, cutting my space open and insert complete bases of, of states in some sense. Um, and so th these two are supposed to be equal. Uh, and this tells you that uh, uh, in this sense, the operator product expansion should be um, associative. That is, uh, uh, if you do the OPE here, uh, as long as this circle does not you know, interfere with this, th th this other uh, operator, uh, it should be the same as the result you get by, by doing this at the level of coercion functions. Um, now, uh, uh, generally, um, uh, okay, so uh, uh, generally, uh, let's say if the distance between these is some um, r, um, and uh, here you have some operators of a higher and higher dimension, uh, they'll be multiplied by some uh, power, uh, higher and higher powers of r. So this will be some series expansion uh, with the infinite series of positive powers of r, increasing powers of r. Um, so the argument I gave you so far uh, would uh, might suggest that um, you know there might be some finite radius of convergence in, in R because you know if I if I take this um, circle to be uh, or take these two points to be sufficiently far away so that this circle that encl encloses these two, two points will touch the, th the third point um, this expansion might break down. Um, that that's a priori something you you might worry about. Uh, but as we'll see later throughout the discussion conform blocks, you can kind of get around that. And uh, um, uh, if you organize your uh, series expansion in some nice way, uh, you can essentially always, uh, uh, the OP is always associative in, in, in some appropriate sense, provided that you do the correct expansion, as long as these points are separated at, uh, at arbitrary location. Um, OK. Now, uh, um, specializing to the 2D CFT, um, it's often of interest to consider, well, it's often useful to consider the OPE um, of a pair of primary operators. Um, so if you have a primaries, so OPE of a pair of primaries, uh, let's say phi i and phi j, uh, at some point uh, z1, z1 bar, at, and phi j is at z2, z2 bar. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, decompose this uh, uh, as a sum of operators at some third point. Uh, this third point, I guess I'm calling this z1, z2, and think of the OP as expanding around z3 there the origin of that disk. So um, there'll be some uh, basis of operators I can write down, which are phi k and z3, z3 bar. Uh, we said that um, in the unitary CFT, at least, uh, all the uh, operators can be expressed as the linear combinations of uh, virasoro descendants of the primary. So let's, so let's say phi k is a primary. I can act on it with the virasoro chain, curly L minus n, and curly L bar minus m, we well, remember the n and m are integer partitions, uh, and um, with some coefficients. Uh, let me organize the sum in the following way, uh, for reasons that will become uh, clear in, in a second. 
Um, so there's a sum over k which labels uh, distinct, but in, in fact orthogonal um, uh, primary states or operators, phi k. Um, so there's some coefficient c i j k. And then there's sum over these levels n and m, sorry, sum over the integer partitions n and m, uh, which can have different levels. Um, and then there's some uh, function which will depend on z1, z2, and z3. In fact, by translation symmetry, it can only depend on z1 minus z3 and z2 minus z3. So, uh, but this function actually factorizes into a holomorphic quantity. Let me call it b n. Uh, it will depend on the weight h i, h j, uh, h k. Uh, the i is this, j is this, and k is this primary on the right hand side. Um, it will depend on coordinate z1 3 and z2 3 holomorphically. And then, okay, I, I'm uh, running out of space. So, um, and then there's also uh, B M uh, that depends on H I tilde, which is, which is the anti-holomorphic weight of phi I, uh, H J tilde, uh, H K tilde, and depends on Z one three bar, Z two three bar. It's the same function, in fact, but just with all the variables replaced. Um, now, why is it of this form? So a priori, you know, this, the right side is a complete basis. Uh, it will be sum of, of the, uh, this basis states with some arbitrary coefficients which are functions of the z's. Uh, but uh, in fact, the uh, uh, conformal word identity, the word identities associated with the Virasorial algebra, the stress tensor, uh, will constrain um, the, these coefficients in such a way that um, there's some overall coefficient, c i j k, which depends only on which primary we're talking about and independent of which descendants we're talking about here. So these cijk depend only on i, j, and k labels, and they are not uh, a priori fixed in any obvious way by the symmetry. On the other hand, these functions bn and bm are entirely fixed by a of symmetry. Uh, they depend only, uh, and, and uh, so there's a holomorphic function here and anti-holomorphic function here. They don't talk to each other. That's because the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic Virasoro algebra commute with one another. Um, and they depend on the weights I guess, uh, well, okay. So they, they depend on, on the weights and they depend on, uh, depend on, on the, which descendant we're talking about and they depend on the, uh, on the holomor the B depends holomorphic on the coordinates. This other B depends anti-holomorphically on the coordinates. Uh, just to uh, illustrate why uh, this would be the case, uh, what you can do is to study, uh, for example, the, um, uh, you can study some three-point function of phi i, phi j, with one of the phi k's, or perhaps uh, some of its Virasoro descendant. Uh, and if you plug this OPE into this three-point function and replace this right-hand side, phi i, phi j, by this sum, uh, if I demand this phi k's are um, uh, orthogonal to one another uh, at the level of uh, uh, two-point functions, so for example, I can, if I demand phi k, phi l, uh, to be this as some separate points to, to be proportional to uh, delta KL. By the way, the, the, for this two-point function of the primaries, the um, uh, position dependence is completely fixed by conformal symmetry, uh, the, by the weight of these phi's. Um, and I can choose a basis such that um, this is uh, proportional to delta KL in a unitary theory. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, this three-point function of phi phi j with some descendant of phi k uh, will only pick up contribution from this phi k term in the sum. Uh, the reason is just because uh, you have some phi k and phi l, doesn't matter what kind of l, the residual chance you act, to act on them. If k and l are different, uh, then you can always move the l's from one to the other by the word identity and the result will end up being zero. Uh, the, the way uh, th this works is that um, you can think of this two-point function as having phi k inserted here and phi l inserted here. And each of these versorial chains can be represented by a sequence of contour integrals of t, acting on with some appropriate powers of z, acting on phi k. Here I have some sequence of uh, contour integrals of t multiplied by some appropriate powers of z minus the, this coordinates, acting on phi l. Uh, and you can you know, deform the contour from one to the other. Uh, and uh, you'll find out that eventually the, the result can be expressed in terms of two-point function uh, phi k phi l itself, which vanishes. So 
So, so generally, this two-point function of the descendants also vanish unless k is equal to L. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> well, you, can, you can convince yourself of this argument by working out some simple, simple cases. It's, uh, um, may, maybe it sounds a little bit abstract here. Um, uh, so, um, uh, okay. So, uh, such a three-point function uh, will only uh, will depend um, uh, will only pick up pick up terms uh, involving this phi k, um, and uh, then a uh, if you inspect this in more detail, uh, you'll be able to uh, see from by this kind of word identities that, that's uh, obtained by this kind of contour deformation tricks um, that. Um, the three-point functions involving different versorial descendants of phi k are all related uh, to one another, uh, and all of these can be expressed um, in terms of uh, just the three-point function uh, of the primary itself. So these are related to the three-point function of just the phi k with phi i, phi j, um, uh, which uh, can be called c i j k. That is this coefficient appears there. Uh, uh, Maybe I should explain this a little better. The, 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 the logic here is that um, I think I ran out of time. Oh, yes, I, I should wrap this up. Um, so the, the logic is that um, let's write it here. Uh, if you have some three-point function of uh, phi i, uh, phi j, and phi k, but then you act on this with some versorial generator, so L minus N, I count this, for example, um, you can evaluate this three-point function. Well, this three-point function will remain invariant if you deform this contour to a contour that surrounds these other guys. You can then collapse the contour on, onto those. And if you inspect more carefully what is the integrand of this contour integral, you realize that um, all of that are already de determined by the singular terms in OP of uh, TZ with phi i and with phi j. Uh, and then this three-point function of the descendants can be related to the three-point function of just the primaries. So, so th that's the basic logic. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let me just uh, summarize uh, now. Um, the, the OP of the primaries are uh, determined by a set of so far unknown coefficients which are related to the three-point functions of primaries, and the, the rest of the stuff can be complicated, but in principle can be de determined by the word identities. Um, so um, this next next lecture will uh, uh, discuss the consequence of uh, plugging in uh, this into the uh, into a four point function, uh, and we'll, from which we'll obtain the conformal block uh, decomposition of the four point function. Uh, we will also uh, discuss how the Korean function of a CFD is defined not just on the plane or the sphere, but on any surface of any genus and any number of operating insertion. Uh, in doing that, we need to also talk about uh, the so-called conformal anomaly or bioanomaly. Um, and, um, and then we'll have some very non-trivial uh, consist consistency constraints uh, on uh, coherent functions of a, general, of a CFT on the general surface with many operating insertions. Uh, these constraints go under the name of modular invariance. So, so we'll discuss that uh, next uh, lecture. Yes. But are there no analogs of the principal series representation in high dimensional CFTs where you have like the dimension being imagining and for complex? They always have to be real. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm uh, so far I'm just interested in unitary representations. You can. Uh, sorry, the question is whether there are anal analogs of some principal series uh, um, where you have uh, 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 you have complex uh, weights of, of the primary. I mean, you can you can discuss uh, such uh, um, representations. Uh, in fact. Uh, you know, there might be some sense in which there are certain elements continuation of, of CFTs uh, uh, that do admit operators of these uh, complex ways. In fact, uh, Slava may have some, I don't know, he's going to say something about it, but it's of interest to Slava. Um, uh, uh, here I'm just restricting myself to unitary theories, at least in the back of my, my, my mind, uh, and uh, also some simple examples of non-unitary theories where these ways are nonetheless real. Um, uh, so, uh, but, uh, uh, but of course, you're, you're welcome to explore the more general possibilities. It could well be that uh, there's some, you know, if you imagine doing some continuation in the space of couplings to complexify couplings, you might be able to produce theory, consistent theories with complex uh, weights as well. 
Uh, yes. So, does that mean like the presence of conserved current depends on what C is relative to one? Uh, 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 well, okay, so the, the, there's a caveat to that statement because, uh, sorry, the question is, uh, as I said that for <laughs> C less than one, these representations uh, generally involve null states, and C greater than one, uh, they don't involve null states. Um, and, w and how that's related to the presence of conserved currents in C less than one versus C greater than one. Um, the caveat to, to that statement is that when I say C greater than one, um, there are generally no null states, and that's for representation of primary weight H non-zero, H positive. If H is equal to zero, um, there's still going to be null states, uh, okay, so uh, for C greater than one. Um, and um, uh, in general, we have weight H and H tilde, uh, so one of them can be set to zero. So let's say H tilde could be equal to zero. So an operator uh, like that, even for C greater than one, will be a conserved current. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, certainly true. That that's certainly true. Uh, so, uh, um, but I mean, the, 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 but but that that's just the ambiguity in the in right decomposing this on on some basis. I mean, the, the state is still well defined uh, even when there are no states. Uh, uh, so w if I compute um, overlaps between phi phi j and some other phi k phi l, um, that overlap is well defined. All right. Well, why don't we uh, take a break for some coffee, and we'll reconvene at ten forty-five.